I haven't gone to Macquarie University, but I've gone to four other universities, which might be a bit of a record for, for, uh, for a lecturer. Uh, the title, Before Endeavours Fade, I actually plagiarised that from a book. There's a book called Before Endeavours Fade, which is about the First World War battlefields. But I think it's a very appropriate title for what I'm about to talk to. And don't worry, it's not going to be death by PowerPoint. This will be the shortest PowerPoint presentation you have ever seen in your university careers. But to make up for it, I'm going to get you to do, do some work. So it's about the preservation of military heritage. What's military heritage? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Um, places where military battles occur, but also um, things like, like old um, weaponry and that that have been used, because obviously our technology changes, so we keep records of what technology was used before. Yep, that's, that's a good summation. There's also another aspect of military heritage is the armed services are very traditional and they have a lot of heritage in them and sometimes the heritage is tied into the sites. So, go and find enter. And I'll just grab my notes. If I stumble every now and again, that's because my printer's on the fritz and I'm using my handwritten notes and every now and again I can't even read my own writing. So, what do you think is the military heritage in this photograph? Plane. Yep. We're very good at preserving hardware. Like if there, this is a, a, a what's called a bow fighter. So there's only one of these left in Australia from memory and if somebody found another one of these all stops would be pulled out to preserve that aircraft. But the significance here to me is where the photograph's taken. This is a place called Kumali Creek in the Northern Territory. When Japan entered the Second World War there are a whole series of airstrips built in the Northern Territory and that was where the air war against Japan was based until after Kokoda and more of New Guinea was captured, they built airstrips further north. So this was the front line of Australia. More so, this was raided by Japanese aircraft six times during the war. There are half a dozen of these airstrips. Fenton was attacked seven times. So 1942, 1943, this was front line Australia. My father was in the Air Force during the Second World War. He flew against the Japanese. Not from these strips, he was in what's called Catalina flying boats and he flew from Bowen. Rarely talked about his experiences, but he said to me once, every time they took off, as far as I were concerned, it was a suicide mission. Because if they were shot down over the ocean, when he was in operations they didn't have air sea rescue. Air sea rescue came later in the war. If they were shot down over New Guinea in the jungle, they'd be lucky to survive the aircraft being shot down. If they survived it, the natives, the natives found them, they'd hand them over to the Japanese and the Japanese would execute them. End of story. So every time they took off, as far as I'm concerned, it was a one-way mission. If they made it back, they were happy. This is 31 Squadron. This is a two-seater aircraft. The establishment of the squadron, anywhere between 12 and 20 aircraft. So 40 aircrew were doing all the combat operations. 31 squadron lost 142 men whilst committed air, air operations. So the airstrip itself is historic. It's historic because this is where men, some aircrew, their last day in Australia was at this airstrip. And some of them have no known graves because they took off and were never found again. So hundreds of men worked here. Air battles were fought over this airstrip. But what are we preserving? We're preserving the aircraft. This airstrip still exists. All the major World War Air airstrips in the Northern Territory still exist. But 
they're gradually going back into the bush. There's no major attempt to preserve them, to commemorate the men who actually fought in those strips. I won't say how long ago, but I visited Brian and Judy up in Darwin when they were living up in Darwin, because we've been friends for a few years now. And <laughs> and if you know where it is, you drive down the Stewart Highway, you drive off the road, and you're on one of these airstrips. And you just walk suddenly through the bush and in the middle of a World War II airstrip. To give an idea of the comparison, I'll give you some homework, but not only will I do it. There's a movie, 12 O'Clock High, which is set in England during the Second World War about an American bomber group. And it starts off with, I'll mention actors' names you've probably never heard of, Dean Jagger. And he finds a mug in a shop. And the next scene is he rides down a country lane on a push bike, stops, climbs over a fence, and he walks into the middle of an abandoned airstrip like this. And then the scene segues from the abandoned airstrip to that airstrip during the Second World War when it was a bomber strip. And he was the adjutant of the unit there. And every time I've gone to an abandoned site like that, I think of that sequence in that movie that you just walk out into an abandoned area that's just derelict, but what it must have been like at the height of the Second World War. And 12 o'clock high, if you look at it closely, it's not a war movie in the sense that, you know, the Yanks are beating the hell out of the Germans. It's actually a movie about leadership. And it's a very good movie about leadership. But that's, that's an aside. So, this is it. We look after the hardware, but we don't actually look after the sites that were frontline Australia during the Second World War. An example of that is Judy sent me some information on the Ingleburn military site, which is something you've probably never heard of. I'm very familiar with it because I spent years in the Army Reserve, and when I was in the Army Reserve, that was Bardia Barracks, and that was the main training facility for the Army Reserve in New South Wales. Going from the statement of significance, it is the first purpose-built military training camp for World War II in Australia. The places where the first Australian troops to see active service in World War II formed up. It has an association with the lives and military experience of generations of former service personnel. Because people who went to Korea trained there and people who went to Vietnam went there. So it's something similar to this, that you have a major camp that has a, a lot of association with the Second World War. It has association with people that was their last, possibly their last home in Australia before they went overseas and never came back. Barnier Barracks was decommissioned a few years ago as a military camp. When I was there, you had sergeant's mess, officer's mess, you had all different barrack blocks, messes for the troops and all this sort of stuff. When they decommissioned it, even though they've made the points here, has an association of lives and military experience of generations of former service personnel, the only thing that remains of that camp is the front gates, the guard house, which is where the cell blocks were if somebody played up, the chaplain's office, the post office, and three buildings, three barracks buildings, one of which was never there, it was transported in from somewhere else. So when I was there, it was a big complex, and you could feel the history as you walk around the place, because the barracks we used have remained unchanged since 1939 when they were built, so there were nothing flashed to, to be in. But the problem is, it's a two or 300 hectare site. So what's the government going to look at? Are they going to look at the history or then look at how much money they can make from that site? So that's why there's only a half dozen buildings left because the government saw more value in the land value. The only reason this still survives today 
is it's got the, of course it's in the middle of nowhere in the Northern Territory. Our military heritage or sites of military heritage are only protected if they've got no other value. Or a classic example of the government, somebody in the government putting their foot in it big time, west of Lithgow there's an area called Morangaroo which is a ammunition storage area. During the Second World War it was used to, to store chemical weapons, mustard gas and phosgene. A few years ago somebody in the government thought we'll sell off part of the camp and make a, a buck out of the, the camp. The only trouble was the part of it they selected was the dumping site for damaged mustard gas and phosgene ammunition. So rather than make selling the land for a, a few million, it cost them millions and millions and millions of dollars to actually mitigate the site, dig up all the buried ammunition. So that's another reason why some of these sites survive. Once again, not because there is an active process to protect them, but because they are just so contaminated. I was there last week and I think it's quite a stark contrast when you, because it's on the way to Kakadu, yep. and you've got another listed site. And before Kakadu, you've got at least five signs that say you need to buy, you know, you need to buy, what is it, an entrance fee to the national park. If you don't, there's penalties. And then you drive up alongside this, which is on a, I thought was interesting, it's on a brown sign, so it blends, it doesn't blend in, but there's no kind of, you know, urgent attention to it. It says War Strip, yeah. it, World War II War Strip. But then you've got these other signs on the other side that is like, you have to buy a permit, you have to buy a permit, otherwise fine supply. So it really goes to show how much uh, preservation they're putting into Kakadu as opposed to something as historical as this. So it's like a really strong contrast. Yeah. And this is, this is a big site. These, some of these airstrips were 5,000 feet long, so that's 1,500 metres long. They are big big sites and big complexes but as you say there's, there's just a, a simple sign saying wartime airstrip and nobody would realise what they're actually looking at because I expect there'd be no interpretive sign saying this is what it is. There's no rangers protecting it you know like the pack you get pulled over for them to check the national park thing and there's so many things in place there whereas this is just alongside the road it's like nothing. Yeah. So in terms of river gas, uh, what's it wasn't a safety risk. The reason why Morangaroo was used as a, to store chemical weapons during the Second World War is there's an abandoned railway tunnel a mile away. And chemical munitions have to be stored in a constant, fairly constant temperature range. So railway tunnels don't heat up very much. They have a constant temperature range. So that's why Morangaroo was selected. The dump site was in the main army camp, so when stuff came in that was damaged, it was there. They, the Australian Army burnt damaged chemical weapons, so they tried to destroy what was contained in them. But even though they might have destroyed what's in them, it still has an effect on the environment. At the end of the Second World War, You've got the Nunes Plateau near, near Morangaroo. At the end of the Second World War, a lot of the sur surplus chemical weapons were taken out there and burnt. You can still see where that site is on the map because nothing has grown there. Oh, the, the, well, they did. They had to go in because I met the bloke who had to do it in the army about 30 years ago when the Nunes Plateau started to be popular with various bushwalkers, four-wheel drives and all that, people came across the site and there was still stuff there. It wasn't as dangerous as it had been, but he had to go in and supervise the cleanup. And he was really annoyed because this was a mess left by the Air Force at the end of the Second World War, and he was an army officer, but the Air Force no longer had the skills to deal with chemical weapons. So he got the job of having to clean up a major site. There's another site in Queensland that was used by the Americans. The Americans weren't as fussy. They didn't try to burn the chemical weapons. They just buried them. And the government sold the site off and somebody went up there with an excavator and started digging 
and they found chemical weapons that were still potentially live. And that hasn't been advertised. And I only know that because somebody rang me up and said, we've got no plans of this site. Can you, with your railway history background, suggest if the railways might have any information because there was a railway siding into it? So, so that's just an aside, yes. So there's sites out there that are, I knew somebody, at the end of the Second World War, they had ammunition, weapons, and all that to dispose of. So a lot of this stuff was taken to abandoned mine shafts and thrown down abandoned mine shafts. Somebody I used to know was a colonel in the army in the ordnance, he was a bomb disposal officer. His part-time job was he would go down to the Australian War Memorial and go through the unit war diaries and try and find where this stuff was because there was no record, no formal record of it. So. Well, actually, I watched a film that wasn't, it's not related to war history, but in a sense it does involve war history, the Second World War. It's an island of Hawaii, but it's um, almost, it's, it's actually the Sacred Island of the Mediterranean uh, And there's a lot of unexploded munitions on that site because uh, Americans used to bomb the so now they've got the land back, but they have to go and sort of pick these unexploded bombs, which of course, you know, when they're going back to their land, it's a great risk. And I don't know, they, they will be in some compensation, but it will be in the other And with the contamination plus the risk of things you know, that explode and kill them. Field, what's, they're called field firing ranges, and there's field firing ranges in Australia that even if the army stopped using them, the same issue. They would never, you'd never be allowed anyone onto the site. I was up, Singleton's a prime case, I was up there many years ago, we're doing, we're firing recoilless rifles and one of the rounds didn't go off. And the adjutant sort of said to me, oh, look, son, you need to go out there and find that unexploded round and destroy it. And I said, but sir, this has been a field firing range since the First World War. Oh, no, no, the, the regs state, no, the field firing ranges are different, sir. We don't have to find it. And he said, oh, no, no. So I'm literally walking into the impact area going, that looks like an unexploded 18-pounder field gun round from the First World War. That's not mine. That is maybe a 25-pounder from the Second World War. I don't have the faintest idea what that is. <laughs> And after it's taken me an hour to walk 100 metres, he's gone, oh, we're running out of time, Sergeant Langer, maybe you'll forget about it. I said, good idea, sir. <laughs> well, it would have been an interesting inquiry, that's for sure. <laughs> so just going back to Bardia and things like this, as I said, part of the military heritage is traditions. When I read the uh, statement of significance, it struck me as the person who wrote this is not aware of the, the Australian Army's military heritage. In the First World War, you had the first AIF, the first Australian Imperial Force. In the Second World War, it was the second AIF, the second Australian Imperial Force. In the First World War, you had the 1st Battalion. In the Second World War, you had the 2nd 1st Battalion because the 2nd AIF 1st Battalion. And that was because there were links between, they were creating links between the battalions of the First World War and the battalions of the Second World War. And the, the Australian Army was always raised on territorial ground. So the 1st Battalion was always a New South Wales Battalion. The statement of significance calls it the Australian Infantry Force. So they can't even get the terminology right. And as I said, there was a great deal of pride within the armed services of the fact that the 2nd 1st Battalion had links to the 1st Battalion from the First World War. So if when somebody's looking at the significance of a site that they can't, in terms of military tradition, they can't understand the significance of that tradition within the army, 
they can't understand the significance site of that site in that sense. said the intangibility it's how do you understand what it was like to live on a base like this during the Second World War that to fly on operations out of it going back to my father again I found a book in a bookshop on Catalina operations during the the Second World War and I gave it to him he was reading it one day and he said so that's what happened a close friend of his had taken off on a mission and they never came back and when he read this book 30, 35 years later, this is when he finally found out what happened to his mate. So there's that aspects of what happened here. People took off and were never seen again. It's hard to, as I say, recreate what it would have been like living and flying out of one of these bases or being at Bardia Barracks training to go and fight in a major European war. Yeah, my husband was in the Air Force, and a lot of the bases, they have a lot of memorabilia, like feathers and planes and trees and a dog. Yeah. What happened to all that with these locations? Were there any buildings or anything there, or were they just an airstrip? No, there's, there's, but one of these airstrips, there's still the remains of the control tower, but at the end of the war, a lot of the buildings were just demolished, and the, yeah. and everything was, taken away and, and the squadron records, the unit records were saved but even there they can be incomplete. So they did a clean up, they did what the army does very really well, they did an emu bob and just cleaned the site up. So there's nothing anywhere recorded about the life of these sites? No, it's, you go into the, this is 31 squadron. There were two squadrons that flew bow fighters, 30 squadron and 31 squadron. You go in the Australian War Memorial site and there's a history for 31 squadron and there's nothing for 30 squadron. So even that extent that it's not recorded. There's, there was a series of books done by the Air Force many years ago, which is the history of air, each Air Force squadron. But the War Memorial website lists how many casualties that squadron had, but the, these books don't. So there is very little written about it. I yep. um, spent time at Corona Downs, which you know has studied um, Americans out of the airstrip. Yep. And there's um, there's lots of things wrote off and there's little parts and everything, but it's a proper past release. So I don't know, like, it's quite sad that they've sort of tried a little bit, which sounds like lots haven't. Yep. But then you can't just walk on to someone's they've got the least kind of walk on to it's its own public. So it's kind of sad that even when they, there is something and how long will they maintain the plaques for? That the well, no one's going to pay for them. Yeah. Yeah, no. There was a couple of photographs I wanted to include in this, and I hunted high and low for them, and I was positive I'd taken them many years ago, but I didn't have them. One was standing in the middle of one of these abandoned airstrips, and another one was of a, a hall up on the Atherton Tableland. Of course, the Atherton Tableland was the main training centre for the Australian Army during the Second World War. When the troops came back from New Guinea and all that, they went to the Athen Tableland. At its peak, there are anything up to 100,000 servicemen on the Athen and Tableland. This building was the last surviving building of all that, and it was just falling into rack and ruin, and it may even be have been demolished by now. And there's plaques scattered around the place, but unless you're familiar with military units, like you'll go up and it'll say, this was the second, second cavalry squadron or the second second independent company. And that would mean absolutely nothing to you, but the independent companies were the commandos. The independent companies 
fought behind Japanese lines and fought some significant battles without any backup at all. The second second independent company was on Timor and the Japanese invaded and everyone in Australia thought that the second second had been captured. But they just went bush and fought a major guerrilla war for months and they didn't get contact with Australia until they could pinch enough radio bits off the Japanese to build a radio and do a link back to Australia. And that's why there was, from certain elements, a lot of disappointment in the way the government has treated Timor. Because the Timor civilians during the Second World War supported the Second Second and later Second Fourth Independent Companies. And they wouldn't have been able to do what they did without the support of the Timor civilians. And thousands of Timor civilians died supporting the Australians. But then. So then they got to Invade, and then having negotiations about the uh, the oil resources in what's called the Timor Gap, and we try and swindle them out of as much as we can. It's gone to arbitration. Yeah, but for anybody, does anybody know about We preserve the famous battles, we don't per preserve the obscure ones. Like, there's another famous battle up there called Shaggy Ridge, but none of you here would have heard of Shaggy Ridge. All you would have heard of is Kokoda. And an Australian won a Victoria Cross on Shaggy Ridge, simply because he led in a, Shaggy Ridge was a narrow ridge line, and they made a number of attacks trying to attack along the, the ridge line, and the Japanese repulsed them each time. And this particular bloke, he was leading his platoon and he said, let me at them, sir, we'll do it. And he attacked up the side of the ridge and led the attack. And they said, he's holding onto vines with one hand to climb up whilst he's firing at the Japanese with his other hand. And because of what he did and his platoon did, they captured Shaggy Ridge after they'd spent all day trying to capture this, this position. And he was awarded the Victoria Cross. And then, Later on the war, he was killed on Balak Papa. Pa so he was regarded as one of the most, a bloke called Diver Derrick, Tom Derrick. And he was regarded as one of the most bravest men in the Australian Army because he had fought at El Alamein and he'd been awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal at El Alamein and people reckon he should have got the VC at El Alamein. Then he got it at Shaggy Ridge and then he was later killed on Balak Papa. Just side, so I think so. But yes, yeah, so that's a famous battle, Shaggy Ridge. But nobody hears about it. All you hear about is Trebook, uh, not Trebook, is Kokoda. Another aside, the Second Fourteenth Battalion, one of the AIF battalions, came back from the Middle East and was thrown straight into the fighting on the Kokoda Trail. They fought across the Kokoda Trail and then they're involved in fighting at places called Buna, Gona and Sanananda on the north coast of New Guinea. When the 2nd 14th Battalion went into action on the Kokoda Trail, it was a thousand strong. When they finally pulled it out of the action after they had captured these 
villages, they could muster 50 men. And a lot of that was not just the Kokoda Trail, but the later battles around Buna, Gona. But once again, everyone would know about the Kokoda Trail, but nobody these days would be familiar with Buna, Gona. And just as an aside, there is a whole of environment Yep. Yeah. So, as I say, it's not just the hardware, it's the sites, but it's the history itself is being lost. And once the history is lost, it becomes very easy to say, we'll just put a bulldozer through this because nobody can remember Coomalee Creek. Not, and this isn't about preserving military heritage. This is about, as I say, remembering what happened. How many war cemeteries are there in Australia? Any, anybody like to hazard a guess? One? Anybody want to do another bit? The sections in parts of cemeteries that go all the yeah. There's 72 war cemeteries in Australia. This is Bathurst. Bathurst has a war cemetery because there was a major training camp on the outside outskirts of Bathurst during the Second World War. Places I know in New South Wales have war cemeteries. Bathurst, uh, Wagga, Albury, Daniloquin because they were either all major military training bases, army training bases, or air force training bases. The largest war cemetery in Australia is in Rookwood Cemetery here in Sydney. And there's uh, 400, over 600 graves in that war cemetery. There is a, a memorial to servicemen who have no known grave servicemen who are lost, and merchant navy seamen, I should say, that were lost off the coast, eastern coast of Australia and the southern coast of Australia. And there is 750 names on that war memorial because the Japanese had a major submarine campaign off the coast of Australia and were sinking shipping. It has the only stone of remembrance in a war cemetery in Australia. And I meant to bring the book sitting in the car, I meant to bring in, but stones of remembrance were put in large World War I cemeteries of a thousand people or more. And it was, you'd have the stone of remembrance and then you'd have the cross of, oh, what's it called? The cross actually has a specific name. So Rookwood is the only cemetery in Australia that has a stone of remembrance. And apparently you're supposed to go to Ambon, where there's a large cemetery, but they couldn't get it to Ambon, so it wound up at Rookwood. So. Yep. But see, Ambon was like Timor. It was where there was a major Australian, there was an Australian infantry battalion on Ambon when the Japanese invaded. They fought the Japanese to a standstill and then surrendered when they ran out of ammunition the Japanese executed most of the survivors. So that's why there's a major war cemetery on Ambon, because of that one battle that went for three or four days. So the men are constantly in war rooms. They're entitled to be in war, they're in war, but they're executed without trial. Yep. I read once that the Australian government stroke armed services executed more war criminals than any of the Allies at the end of the Second World War. We executed more. Yeah. And we should be No, with the war crime trials, there was a determined effort by the Australian Armed Services to track down the perpetrators of these massacres. Well, they caught a lot of them and they were sentenced to death and they were executed. There was a very strong sense of retribution after the, the Second World War, whereas a lot of war crime trials in other countries petered out because they just wanted to, to forget about it, use the people who are war criminals to help rebuild those countries. 
but it was never the case in Australia. The Australian government and armed services hunted down the, the murderers. So, just to sum up, as I said, military heritage is really three things. It's the hardware, like the aircraft, which are very easy to preserve. It's the sites, like Coomley Airstrip or Bardia Barracks, that it is hard because you're looking at something intangible that the lives of the people who live there, they can equate to a, a dirt strip or a set of barracks. If it was a set of barracks on the outskirts of a major city where all the major training camps were, the value of the land will be considered in the long term more valuable than the heritage. And the third thing is the tradition of the armed services. The armed services are very good at maintaining their traditions, but when it is tied back into a, a camp that nobody is based at, and somebody from outside who does a heritage report and really does not understand the heritage of the army and they just go to the obvious sources like the official histories and all that sort of stuff, they are not really developing a sense of what that place meant to the people who are there. Any questions? Just out of curiosity, Richmond Air Force Base, do you think that'll go once they move the airport out there? Oh, it will. Richmond over the years has been mooted as the second airport and, and all sorts of sorts of things. It it may it may go. It's, it's hard to say. It's I was flying I was out there with the army one time flying around a helicopter and the two pilots were saying this is a really difficult airstrip because at each end of the runway, one end of the runway is Windsor, the other end of the runway is Richmond. So you've got problems with if something goes wrong they either land in Richmond or they land in Windsor. But R Richmond RAF base also has a war cemetery. My husband is going to get this work. Yeah, it's, you drive the road that sort of goes around the outside, it's on the, the western end of the airstrip. I think it's so well located, that's why they put the transport wires and all that sort of thing, that's why often under each one day it became a civilian. Well, it could, they could, they could sell it off. It's got a lot of history as well. Just on the the heritage, a classic example, as I said, the Australian Army was raised very much on local grounds. That uh, it wasn't a, a regular army was formed, that they had units that came from all over Australia. So as I said, the 1st Battalion was a New South Wales Battalion. The 5th Battalion was a Victorian Battalion. Or more or less, the 1st to 4th Battalions were New South Wales, 5th to 8th Victorian, 9th Queensland, 10th South Australian, 11 Western Australia, 12 Tasmanian West Australia, then the cycle started again. 13th was to 13, 14, 15, 16 when New South Wales battalions. The militia, the predecessor to the Army Reserve, were obviously raised on local grounds and they had strong links to the local community which continued on to the Army Reserve and all that sort of stuff. 20 years ago, the government looked at all these Army Reserve sites and thought they're worth a fortune. So they moved all the units out and sold the land. They broke all the traditional links with the local communities that have been grown up since the 1920s and 1930s. And I know one of, one of the, these units is what's called the Mortar Platoon. The Mortar Platoon, they're all mates. They grew up in the local area. They joined the Army Reserve together and their depot has been closed and they're being amalgamated with another unit somewhere else. And they all quit the Army Reserve on the day the depot closed because this was part of their community. Where they're going to, they had no links to. And that's, once again, heritage, that these sites that go back to the 20s and 30s and all that, that had strong local ties because, like the uh, 17th Battalion, was the North Shore Regiment and has always been based on the North Shore of Sydney. The 4th Battalion was the St George Regiment, always based in that area. But now they have no ties to the communities that they grew up in and recruited and all that. So once again, the, the military heritage has been thrown out of the world, 
the window because the government can make a buck out of the site. Well, one of the things in terms of protection where learning through this course is uh, how different the government heritage and because uh, a lot of the army was raised from, say, country areas and uh, local areas. The local council probably is in charge of a lot of military <coughs> in terms of monuments and other representations of military history. And obviously other, other parts of military heritage are on heritage sites, either the state or the conference, and then we've got the places and overseas monuments, like and what we see them all or change those sort of places. So from that point of view, there's also monuments and other uh, preservation legislation that uh, is true. But it seems that it isn't well regulated and uh, reported. So I mean, through this course, probably driven by me, my PhD, we've been talking a lot about uh, Aboriginal cultural heritage, and that solves the same problem. And it's not reported very well, and it's not covered in legislation. just there's no specific military heritage legislation that, that you could find it's just the site is assessed on the basis of the, the local heritage act and the same consideration as if it's a 1820s flour mill will be given to a 1940s military base one of the biggest ongoing fights that's been going on for a number of years is Point Cook in Victoria is the home of the Air Force it was the first military air base in Australia. The government tried to sell it off a number of years ago and there was a, a long drawn out fight to save it but it's still not guaranteed that another future government will turn around and say let's move because the Air Force has its historical collection there and does flying displays off the airstrip and all this sort of stuff. So there's no guarantee that a future government will say nah we're going to get rid of it because we can make millions out of, out of this. Any other questions? So, question. I mean, military heritage preservation, I suppose it's been complicated by the fact that there's two sides to a war, and I mean, they, they've got more of the heritage that's intrinsically related to our side of the conflict as well. Is it, is it difficult to preserve? Uh, well, there's always the comment that winners write, write history, for a start. Something I discovered doing this there's a German war cemetery in Australia. And that came about because under the Geneva Convention, whichever country captures the troops has to look after them. So that's why a large number of German and Italian prisoners of war came to Australia during the war because they'd been captured by the Australians in North Africa. And that's why there's a German war cemetery because the German soldiers who died here in captivity were buried in the one cemetery and it's now a German war cemetery. But or 365 Japanese soldiers were killed during the Kara breakout as well as four Australian soldiers and two of them were awarded the George's Cross which is the civilian equivalent of the Victoria Cross for their actions in trying to stop the, the breakout so so yes a few years ago I can't think where it was there's a big house in Victoria that was used as part of a prisoner war camp for German officers and a couple of years ago, whilst they're doing excavations around it, they found an escape tunnel the Germans had dug to try and get out of it. And that ties back to what you said. There's no history. You're, there's plenty of books written on 
you know, English POWs escaping from camps in like the Great Escape, the, the wooden horse and all this. But what do you know about the fact that there were German prisoners here in Australia who are also trying to escape? So, and as you say, that a lot of records at the end of the Second World War disappeared to England and Germany and they're still possibly buried in archive, not in Germany, England and the US and are possibly still still buried in the archives. Well, they do have a big dive, which they have been there recently. They have tunnels, or World War II tunnels, uh, that you can tour if there are guys and take you there. So hopefully, you know, they will come out, which you can't find your way out. But we're certainly, even though those airstrips aren't well looked after, there are other sites, you know, because the Japanese uh, stacks and uh, ships and sort of attacks on the ships and dive and other. Well, there's a major air raid on Darwin, and there are over 300 casualties in, in Darwin. And ships were sunk in the harbour, and an ammunition ship blew up in the harbour, and all this sort of stuff. And, and they only found one of the wrecks a few years ago from that air raid. They didn't know where exactly the ship had, had sunk. And just on what you're talking about, the other side's history, yes, there's not much that we see that's written on it. And the German soldiers was just as brave as the Australian soldiers. One of the most courageous things I've read about was a German general was commanding an army group at the very end of the war when the war was coming to an end. He was given orders to turn his troops north and drive for Berlin to try and rescue Hitler. And he said, he decided, no, my moral responsibility is to the men under my command. And what he actually did, there was another German army group surrounded by the Russians. So he turned his army group east, punched through the Russian lines, and we could meet up with this other army group, extracted them from where they were surrounded, then turned west, fought his way back through the, the <coughs> Russian lines until he could get to the German, uh, sorry, the American lines, then set up a perimeter and gradually got his men across the river into the German, into the American side of the river so they could be captured by the Americans who would treat them far better than the Russians. And there was apparently at times American artillery firing in support of the Germans because they knew what this bloke was trying to do. He could have been shot at any stage for dissipating this order, but he decided his moral duty was to the men under his command and get as many of them to safety as possible. So. So yes, and, and as, I say, as you say, there's not that much history from the other side because the victors write history. And it wouldn't be until 20, 30 years after the war that the Germans would start writing some of their own, own history. So was his, was his uh, direction made any difference? Because I mean, the history is So was this guy, did he, did he change the course of history? Uh, Not really. It wouldn't have made any significant difference because it just, it just, he would have just wound, have wound up having to sacrifice his troops on a forlorn attempt to rescue Hitler. So he decided he would save his men rather than, than save a dictator. Thank you.